only started getting, you know, really kind of digging <coughs> into the problem of NGOs. Um, you know, for a number of years, I've kind of looked at it and I've seen a, a worry because what's going on is is that less and less um, we're relying on our own self-organization, our own movements. More and more, our movements are becoming subsumed into a kind of of a not-for-profit model. Um, and so, I hope that you know, you know, we can, uh, you know, collectively come together. You know, look at at these issues and see, you know, what is it we can do? How can we get the movement out of the, this kind of trap that it seems to have been caught into? So. First off, you know, we want to talk about you know what is an NGO. You know, it's uh, you know it's it is pretty self-descriptive. It's any non-governmental organization. It's also not a private business. And typically, when we're talking about NGOs, we're talking about not-for-profits. So, you know, a, you know, big corporation like Ford isn't a government organization, but it's you know very much a profit for organization. When we think of not-for-profits, we usually kind of think of the small little organizations that we create. For example. Um, well, not, some not so small, but Greenpeace, um, Workforce One, um, such things. But you know, a hospital is a not-for-profit, an NGO. Churches are NGOs. Universities are NGOs. Um, think tanks are NGOs. Um, and foundations, including uh, moving in more children. Okay. <laughs> including. You know, and these are, you know, some of these are pretty big business. Uh, <coughs> you know, right now, um, the number of NGOs operating internationally throughout the world is estimated, there's no real handle on all this, to be about 40,000 just in an international situation. In Russia, there are almost 300,000 NGOs. In India, which leads the world, it has over 3 million. Um, and according to the World Bank, which is itself an NGO, uh, it is now estimated that over 15% of total overseas development aid is channeled through NGOs. So we're not talking a small part of the or, you know a small part of the, of the economy. We're not talking about a small little sector. This is huge. This is a very large part of really the capitalist order. Um, <clears throat> Now, because this is such a large, um, you know, such a, there's so much, there's such a broad uh, amount of stuff, you know, that we could be talking about. You know, it would, I mean, I could literally talk. We could have a whole university course just on this subject, and that's you know well beyond what we're capable of doing today. Uh, so I want to try and narrow the scope just to talk about community-based organizations, to talk about kind of our social movement um, NGOs, uh, with one exception. And that's, you know, we'll talk about foundations as well because, you know, it's, you know, the big, you know, the big elephant in the room is money. You know, we need money to do everything that we need to do. Who's got the money? Well, the foundation's got the money. That's where we go to get our money. And that's really the, kind of the heart of the problem. Um, So I want to kind of start with a quote from a comrade from Canada, first member of the First Nations. He said, the condition of revolutionary work today is historically rooted within the development of the world system in its current coordinates of neoliberalism in the U.S. empire. And with the collapse of revolutionary movements in this country, alongside the collapse of actually existing socialism, the not-for-profit, the non-profit industrial complex is a global feature, and it is, despite its name, part of the political apparatuses of the state, in stripping away with one hand to give half back with the other, capitalism with a human face. The NGO is now the predominant organizational form that pervades in the movement today. Um, as I said before, you know, that one big elephant in the room is money. And where we get our money is typically either from state grants or from foundational grants. Now, foundations were started you know, um, as a way for capitalists to pass on their wealth to their children without it being taxed. 
Currently, the rate of taxation for inheritance is about 35%. So 35% of any dollar would have gone to the state um, for us to use on whatever programs. Um, and we'll you know, leave aside for the moment that in the hands of the state it would probably be used against us anyway. Uh, but it would be available for uses in other ways. Um, historically, that taxation rate for inheritance has been much higher, 55% as of 10 years ago. One of the first foundations was set up by Nelson, uh, Nelson Rockefeller. You know, took his enormous wealth, put it into a foundation, and then set his children up to run it. So they get to pay themselves out of this. Um, they get taxed on the income they draw from it, but the actual wealth itself, rather than you know, losing most of it to the state and whatever semi-democratic control might be exercised over it, even though in the interest of capitalism, you know, that doesn't happen. They get to keep all that money. And as I said, you know, who sits on these boards? Well, it's the children of the capitalists themselves who sit down, set them up. Also, people who rise up through um, various means become capitalists themselves. So if you look, a lot of these people, they all sit on the same boards. When you look at, at some of the larger foundations, it'll be the same set of people, or the same people from the set of families. Um, Bill Gates, who we'll come back to later, got his fortune because his mother sat on the foundation with, uh, when she was a bank president, sat on the board, a foundation with uh, the head of IBM. And so that's how he ended up becoming one of the wealthiest men in the world. Because even though he wasn't already, you know, he wasn't a poor person by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, the capitalists more and more are using these as a way, you know, these foundations as a way of shielding their wealth, uh, perpetuating their wealth, and and kind of connecting to each other. There are over 67,000 foundations in the United States today. We're not talking about not-for-profits, we're just talking about foundations themselves. Of the top 100 foundations in the United States, they control $200 billion in wealth. Um, in the terms of the data that I started collecting, about 1975, there was about $30 billion in, um, in the wealth of most um, for all of the foundations combined, about $30 billion. In that period, uh, accounting for inflation, that total has now come up to $141 million in 1975 dollars. In actual current dollars, it's a, for 2008 was about $468 billion in the control of these foundations. This is not a small amount of money. You know, and, but, you know, they took a little bit of a hit with the, with the recession. So, you know, as you, even though all of us are unemployed, you know, they lost about a fifth of their wealth. <laughs> <laughs> So, early on, they realized that they could start using this wealth not merely to, you know, not merely just to hold on, you know, these foundations not merely to hold on to their wealth, but in order to hold on to the whole system as a whole. So, at the very same time that Nelson Rockefeller was using the, gov you know, the, uh, the governor of Colorado to send in, uh, the National Guard to shoot down the Ludlow strikers in Ludlow, uh, Colorado. His foundation was going out there and providing charity work to those same people that he was, whose union he was crushing. Now, if they had a union and they were able to negotiate for a contract, they wouldn't need charity work. And that's kind of the, the one of the big aspects of this is that they use these foundations to, to stop structural change and then, with the other hand, give back a little bit of charity. Uh, so, more than 50 years ago, and this was actually written in the 1960s, uh, the Morgan firm decided to infiltrate left-wing political movements in the United States. This was relatively easy to do since these groups were starved for funds and eager for a voice mm -hmm. to reach the people. Wall Street supplied both. 
The purpose was not to dominate, destroy, or take over, but was really threefold. To keep informed about the thinking of left-wing or liberal groups, to provide them with a mouthpiece that they could blow off steam, and to have a final veto on their publicity and any possible, possible actions if they ever went radical. Um, and, you know, we see this, you know, there, there are countless examples of this going on. In 1967, when King was holding a strategy meeting uh, with the SL, you know, with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he was getting ready to come out against the war in Vietnam. And he was ready to break with the Johnson administration, but he, he knew that doing so would cost the SLC, the SCLC money. They'd already had a 40% drop the year before. Um, and after his first speech, he comes out again. He says, look, they're, you know, this is going to hurt us. Um, so they're willing to, you know, to support civil rights. When they actually started coming out against the war, they started losing money. Um, NGOs are also not just agents of, you know, these foundations are not just agents of capitalism, but um, smaller NGOs become agents of the state through this con control by the capitalists. Um, so, groups that were set up to deal with the very real problem <coughs> of violence against women, instead of coming up with constructive <coughs> solutions, community-based solutions, end up supporting laws to imprison people, and end up supporting law, you know, to basically make the police state more powerful. Um, and this has a, an unintended consequence of people becoming less willing to actually report their spouses or their, their partners for battery because then they'll lose their support, they'll lose their partner, um, and possibly even, you know, suffer uh, physical, physical harm as a result of, of um, pushing, retaliation. of retaliation. Um, also, instead of creating community based, you know, like working together to solve you know, the issue of violence and, and um, you know, however it would be done, it becomes more, the movements, anti-violence movement became more dominated with charity work, setting up women's, you know, setting up shelters for battered women, um, providing services for battered women. And I'm not saying any of this is a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. These are very real needs. Um, but instead of solving the problem, they're putting Band-Aids on the problem. Um, and you know, our movement, the reason we get involved is because we want to fix these problems, not, you know, salve over bad wounds. Um, NGOs also enable the state to kind of shed some of the, you know, the demands that we put on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the 1930s, a million people joined and went through the Communist Party of the United States, America. Um, most of them left. I mean, it was never a million people in the organization at any one time. But they got out there, they organized, millions of people marched for benefits that we consider, you know, just, you know, our rights today, like unemployment, social security, uh, et cetera. And we consider, you know, we get our unemployment from the state. You know, we do our work for the state. Well, here in Florida, they have used an NGO, Workforce One, to shut, you know, as an excuse to shut down and to transfer all of their, as much of their work off the state as possible into an, you know, a not-for-profit called Workforce One. Now, if you actually have a problem with your unemployment, you can't go to them for help. You still have to go to the state. But they've shut down every office except for two. There's one in Orlando. There's one in Tallahassee. One third of the population lives in Southeast Florida, and there's no unemployment office down here. And so what are you supposed to do, drive up to Orlando to see a human being? Or spend a couple weeks calling on the phone, hoping to get through to somebody eventually. Um, and really all Workforce One's job is, is not to help you with your problems with unemployment, it's to get you a job, to get you off the rolls, um, to teach you skills you know, that most of us already had, because if we have unemployment, we already know how to get a job, because we had a job. <laughs> um, so, but they'll teach us how to write a new resume or how to go to an interview, as if we didn't know how to do that in the first place. <laughs> um, they won't teach you new, better skills to get a better paying job. Um, 
we saw a huge shift away from state-based aid, you know, demands that we put on the state and said, you know, we demand this, you will do this with our tax dollars, um, to our faith, forms of faith-based aid. So under Bush, they started shutting down a lot of their own government services, giving money to the churches who would turn around and give it to you. Now this had the effect, and it was deliberate, effect of promoting religion at the same time. And they wouldn't have any rules saying, oh, well, you know, uh, this is federal money, so you have to obey federal anti-discrimination laws. So this money is going to help charities that were anti-gay, anti-woman, anti-atheist. Um, and uh, you know, another effect of that is that people became more and more reliant on churches for everything. So if you've ever read Barbara Ironreich's uh, book, Nickel and Dimed, one of the people that she talks to says the very first thing when you go to a new town is you find a church. Because that church will help you out. You know, if there's any problems, if you need rent, if you need clothes, you know, you need a place to stay, they'll hook you up. Um, this is all stuff that we used to get through the state, Section 8, you know, food stamps, all kind, you, know, you know, money allowances, all kinds of stuff like that, that we used to, you know, as a community used to provide, are now done through these organizations, and of course, you know, it has the attempt, you know, the, the result of people becoming more religious. Um, <coughs> NGOs are also used to dominate other countries, or to perpetuate policies that our government would like. In Haiti, uh, there are about approximately 10,000 NGOs. Um, <coughs> My understanding is, is that per capita, they have more NGOs than any other country in the world, except possibly India. India having, you know, has over a billion people, 3.3 million NGOs. Um, NGOs are, you know, through, you know, funding, through given funds for the United States, from organizations in the United States, were given $200 million in Haiti to fight against the minimum wage law in 1991. Um, as I understand it, I think a minimum wage law was finally passed in Haiti a couple of years ago. It's about 100 boards a day. Yeah. Um, I don't know actually what that translates into. Not how long? 15? Yeah. Um, and that's today, you know, 10 years ago. Right, that should be 20 years ago now. Um, 70% of the NGOs in Haiti are funded by the U.S. government. And the Haitian government actually has very little, you know, because of all this, the Haitian government has been pulled back from more and more from interacting with its own people. Um, and today, I mean, after the, the earthquake, I mean, not just, there weren't just physical reasons of the, the complete destruction of Port-au-Prince and, and the areas around it that kept the Haitian government from being able to intervene in any kind of meaningful way after this disaster. They also were a withered husk. They weren't, you know, even if there hadn't been an earthquake, if there had just, and they still needed to intervene in such a way, they wouldn't have been capable of doing it because all of their muscle really are in the form of these NGOs. 19 percent, 19 cents per dollar is spent on food for disaster victims. Five cents per dollar was spent to pay, pay Haitian laborers involved in the food distribution. One cent per dollar went to fund efforts by the Haitian state. Thirty-three cents per dollar went to the U.S. military. And selected NGOs got about 42 cents of the dollar. Um, and we'll come back to this a little later why, you know, these NGOs are getting so much money, but it's not going back to the people they're supposedly serving. Um, because they serve, you know, they not just serve the imperial agenda, they also share some of its beliefs. So about 40 years ago, you might remember, that you know, might have heard of, if you were there, if you were around then, you might have heard of it, or since then you might have heard of what happened, and it's called the Green Revolution really introducing new uh, farming methods to the, the former colonial world, um, new techniques, new seeds, uh, and really what this did, and, and the idea behind it was that there's all this starvation in the third world because there's too many people and not enough food. So we'll grow more food and then nobody will starve anymore. Starvation has actually continued apace. 
Um, because the real problem it was never that there wasn't enough food. It was, it was never that there were too many people. It was always that it's, you know, the system is, it's a distribution system. The people with money get food. The people without money starve. And no matter how much food there is, if you don't have money, you're not getting any food. Uh, and this had the, you know, the, the, the effect of making it harder for farmers to stay in business because it required more money to buy all the fertilizer, to buy the machines. It enabled successful farmers to buy up the land around them. And it ended up increasing poverty. And so you end up having really the growth of these giant slum cities. Uh, and at the same time, NGOs start funding these uh, population growth initiatives. So really kind of pushing uh, family planning um, and various methods for doing this. Um, in Puerto Rico, by the end of 1990, 42% of the women of childbearing age had been sterilized. Many of them involuntarily. Most of them uh, were not told what it actually meant. They thought, okay, well, I just, I'll be able to choose when I have my child instead of just getting pregnant forever. No, no it's done. You're, you're never having a child again. Um, that, for me, is one of the sickest statistics I've ever heard. You know, almost half the women who could have children no longer are capable of doing so. Um, and this wasn't just, you know, it's not just Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is where the experimentation went on, where the United States would do things to see what would happen and then export that elsewhere. Um, in some places, the people fought back. Uh, one, uh, many years ago, uh, we brought a, um, or my school brought a Bolivian peasant organizer up to our university, and the story she was telling is that the, these um, couple of people in uh, the Peace Corps were going around pushing this family planning stuff on people, and the peasants kind of rose up and um, did to them what they were doing to everybody else yelled at them, um, which, you know, I find horrifying at one level, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sorry, turn around, this is fair play. <laughs> <laughs> Just one thing, I, I was a social worker in Spanish Harlem in the 60s, and when Puerto Rican women would give birth at Metropolitan Hospital, they were automatically sterilized. Yeah. And this was in the, in the 60s in New York. Yeah. It wasn't just for them. Yeah. They did it to people who, to women who they felt were uh, not mentally capable of taking care of their children. They did it to American Indians, they did it to black women. Um, you know, it just, I mean, that policy alone was kind of widespread in the United States at that one point. And it even, from what I understand, it did not end until the 1980s, which for me, that's when I was in high school. So for me, that's not that long a time ago. Um, on May 21st in Washington, uh, well, these NGOs are often used to support, directly support our imperial agenda. So on May 21st in Washington, Andrew, not... Natsios, the head of USAID, gave a speech blasting U.S. NGOs for failing to play a role many of them didn't realize they had been assigned doing public relations for the United States government. According to Interaction, the network of 160 relief and development NGOs that hosted the conference, Mr. Natsios was irritated that starving and sick Iraqi and Afghan children didn't realize their food and vaccines were coming to them courtesy of George Bush. And from now on, NGOs had better do a better job of linking their humanitarian assistance to U.S. foreign policy and making it clear that they are an arm of the U.S. government. If they didn't, Interaction reported, Nazios threatened to personally tear up their contracts and find new partners. NGOs, uh, NGO funding has also been responsible for the increase in religious fundamentalism, the growth of religious fundamentalism throughout the world. Um, in Israel, or in Palestine, occupied Palestine, mm. the Israeli government funded what ended up becoming Hamas. Um, and while, of course, you know, I so strongly support Palestinian right of self-determination, how they want, how they choose to struggle against their occupiers. Uh, prior to that time, that struggle had been led by 
socialists and secular uh, fight, you know, secular groups, um, starting in the 19, late 1970s and 1980s, that became dominated more and more by right-wing religious zealots. Uh, the same is true in H India, where Hindu national, what's called Hindu nationalism, which is uh, various groups that are aligned around the a kind of very right-wing version of the Hindu religion. Um, that you may have heard stories about them burning down uh, Hindu mosques. Um, part of the reason why they're at war in Kashmir, um, and it, you know this, this uh, right-wing religious revival in India. In Latin America, we see it with the rise of evangelicalism, of Christian evangelism. It's traditionally a Catholic country, and this happened at almost the same time that le uh, liberation theology began to spread throughout Latin America. Um, and so the dictator, for example, the dictator in uh, uh, Guatemala was a right-wing Christian evangelist. And more and more we're seeing this throughout Latin America. And you know, we see it in other ways uh, with, for example, uh, feminist organizations supporting imperial wars. In, you know, so we have to be in Afghanistan to save the women from the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Although the current government is scarcely better, and in some ways is, is worse because, you know, at least under the Taliban there wasn't any rape. Although you can get raped in your own house. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 bad, bad situation all around. But also, NGOs were calling for intervention in Yugoslavia because of the so-called rape camps, which evidence of which has yet to be found. Mm -hmm. um, but. Everybody heard about it. Everybody, we've got to go there and save them. In my university, one of my Marxist professors, you know, with even talking about these things, and you know, they did a very good job of kind of snow, you know, snowballing us. Um, and really, I mean, it kind of comes back to is that you know these foundations, the government, this money gives them control over us. During the civil rights movement, um, the groups that were really independent of the foundations were able to go farther and do more and push the agenda more. Most of them were based on churches because the church had its own independent money base. Um, the Black Panthers also had their own found it, you know, had their own money. Um, Core, the Congress of Racial Equality, got sucked up into this trap. They were originally an anti-capitalist organization. They started talking about black power, and the Ford Foundation approached them with a program in the city of Cleveland. They were like, we're going to identify certain black leaders in the community. We're going to show them what capitalism is really all about. Brought them to, you know, to these seminars uh, in hopes that, I mean, the official reason was to kind of, um, you know, to, to forestall an outbreak of violence, which didn't happen. There were riots that summer anyway. Uh, but over the intervening years, the politics of that organization, the Congress of Racial Equality, ended up supporting black capitalism as opposed to black revolution. Ended up supporting, you know, that, uh, and although they had an officially militant stance, less and less they were opposed to the system more and more about um, getting a piece of the pie. Uh, we saw this last year with ACORN. Um, as soon and and this funding actually makes these groups pretty fragile, um, since they don't. Uh, there are very tight controls put on how the money can be spent, on who the money can be spent on, and if it's pulled away, the group can disappear overnight. Acorn, as soon as the U.S. government pulled the funding on Acorn, it collapsed. I mean, there, I think there's still a branch out in Los Angeles, um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, there used to be one up here in, in Fort Lauderdale, and I don't know where else, but. You know, everything. I almost had a job with Acorn myself back in the night in Chicago. Um, there's a group called Incite Women of Color, mm -hmm. which is a very radical women of color organization. And they really kind of kick-started this whole questioning of NGOs and the not-for-profit complex because they were putting together a, a program for a grant for about $100,000, went to the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation gave them the money then somebody went and checked their website, found out that Insight was actually opposed to the occupation of Palestine, and they pulled the money. 
and Insight had to scramble really fast because they were dependent on the money. They actually managed to raise it and continue on, but then after that they're like, well, what is this thing that we've gotten tangled into? It's, but, um, you know, that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, one of the other aspects that this has done to us is it's changed our focus from community organizing and movement building to kind of professionalism. So we have to, instead of have building kind of organic democratic structures, leaderless structures, we have to have boards of, you know, we have to have boards of directors. We have to have definite hierarchies. People started having to have degrees because you wouldn't get a degree unless you had somebody who had a degree in social work or had a degree in this. And so less and less people of the community were able to control their own organizations. More and more, it had to be somebody who had a college degree. And let's face it, most of the people with college degrees in this country are from a particular um, skin color. Um, which has nothing to do with people's abilities, but when I was in school, you know, uh, I lived in a city that was 44% black, and less than 10% of the people who were admitted to the school were black, and less than that even graduated. I mean, a smaller percentage even graduated, so it's really, you know, as foundations exert more and more control over our organizations, um, it really drives out the people who should be controlling them. It also requires groups to succeed at everything because the funders don't want to give money to groups that are, aren't you know, meeting their goals. And so even if they fail, if you try some kind of strategy, you know, if you want to do some kind of you know, like science, uh, and say, all right, we tried this thing, it didn't work, let's try something else. They can't do that because if they go back and say, well, we tried this thing, it failed, they don't get any more money. So everything they do, no matter what, it has to succeed. And they have to keep kind of doing it. Uh, and that's, you know, that doesn't actually help us any. Um, and, and then again, you know, not all of these not-for-profits, not all these NGOs are actually good things. Um, or actually interested in helping out. None of them are kind of honest. Um, we remember from a few years ago, United Way. United Way is a really big, huge, and I'm just pulling this as an example, because um, it does clearly does not fit in you know, our kind of movement, but they were paying, I think it was close to a million dollars for the director, $750,000 I think was the salary, the leading salary. Um, just because it's not for profit doesn't mean you can't make it a lot of money doing it. Uh, in England, there was a group called Cafe Direct, who was a not-for-profit to bring, um, to do more fair trade kind of stuff with Latin America. Oxfam launched a campaign against all these competitors of Cafe Direct, all these groups that um, they were paying their, their workers less, their pittance. But it turns out Oxfam actually has 25% control of Cafe Direct. So this campaign wasn't really you know, there weren't clean hands. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which everybody says is doing a lot of really good work. They've spent six billion dollars on vaccines throughout the world. Again, not one of us. It's a huge <coughs> foundation. Um, they own 200 million dollars in various pharmaceutical companies. So the money that they're, you know, they with one, give with one hand, take back with the other. Um, and then, Getting back to Haiti, and another example of this, you know, using, you know, NGOs, you know, for personal profit. Um, the U.S. official who is in charge of relief efforts following Haiti's earthquake has accused a major contractor of shortchanging his assistance in securing more than twenty million dollars in reconstruction deals after he left his post. Uh, the Associated Press reports Louis Luck claims that the Haiti Recovery Group owes him half a million dollars for his consulting services. You know, so that's, you know, you know, you, and you do, uh, if you've you know, ever worked with grant writers, you know, you end up paying a lot of money to these grant writers or the people who get you access because, well, you need the access, they need the money. 
Um, and I actually, you know, I can't, this is not any substantiated, but I've heard that in certain fundraising parties and whatnot that go on, uh, the group that the funds are actually being raised for actually receive less than 10% of the money. Almost all of it goes to the fund, the person <coughs> running the party, um, doing the fundraising. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, they are also extremely exploitive. Ralph Nader, um, Green Party candidate for president sometimes, sometimes just running with the support of the Green Party, uh, all around swell guy and, and hero to many, um, mm -hmm. is a cruel boss, drives his people very hard. Two of his organizations, Multinational Monitor and Public Citizen, both where their workers tried to unite, he fired them. And this is a guy who's supposed to be a hero of the working people. You try, you, you try to unionize, he crushes you. Greenpeace in L.A. in the early part of this millennia, uh, the workers in L.A. tried to unionize. I don't know the outcome of that. Um, perhaps Jeff might enlighten us later. You were there then, weren't you? Sorry. Distracted. Uh, okay. uh, same thing in Canada. They tried to unionize. Greenpeace shut them down. So it's not, you know, these, these organizations, even the ones that are, you know, politically progressive, even the ones that we think are on our side, can sometimes be you know, horrible. People work 13 hours a day, 80 hours a week, and get crap pay. I mean, we're supposed to sacrifice because we're doing charity work. We're supposed to, you know, have, you know, be poor ourselves. Um, so that's kind of just a, a high-level overview of the problems that we see. Um, I do not have any answers. You know, I'm not coming in here and saying, oh, NGOs are horrible, because there are very real problems that NGOs address. Um, people are starving, people need clothes, people need, you know, a place to live. Um, and NGOs feed them, NGOs clothe them, NGOs get them a place to live, NGOs do a lot of really good work. You know, and we get ourselves involved because we want to do, we want to help people, we want to do good work. Um, you know, so this is not, you know, don't, this is not in any way a, let's dump on NGOs, let's dump on not-for-profits, let's dump on all the work that, that, you know, the real work that we're doing. But how do we take control of our movement back? How do we get it past the, the constraints that are being put on us? How do we start building a social movement? How do we start building a mass movement to actually change the situation we're in so that we don't need not-for-profits anymore? You know, now, like I said, I'm a, I'm a communist. I think, well, we need a communist revolution in the United States. However that comes about, I have no idea how we're going to do it. Um, other people may have different ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I would like to hear from a lot of the people who actually do NGO work or not-for-profit work about the experiences they've, they've had, about the problems they've run into, and if any solutions you know, how do we how do we get past this? Because you know, more and more I'm hearing from people, um, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. And it's not something I've been I, and I've been in the movement for 20 years. And it's not something I've heard really a lot of until recently. A lot of people, more and more, are starting to criticize the NGO model. Um, so I think it's kind of a an issue whose time has come. And I think those of us here who are really interested in building a social movement you know, need to start talking about it. And I'm going to sit down now. Okay, we're going to start discussion. Let me call on people since we have so many people, and I think that will keep it uh, flowing a little better. Um, so, oh, thanks. I think that's actually mine. Okay. Um, so, anybody, got any, anybody want to open up? Or we'll just start pointing at people around <laughs> Stephanie. Um, I did a little research on some of the big green NGOs, um, and I wanted to read a couple paragraphs from an article by a Canadian pair of activists, Cory Morningstar and Gregory Vickery, um, who do a lot of exposure about that. <clears throat> um, they talk about um, the big green movements as being actually structured to prevent us from 
um, coming up with the solutions to the climate crisis. Um, and the only solution basically is to stop burning oil and coal, and that's going to destroy the global capitalist economy. So therefore, um, big corporations have a very strong interest in preventing us from coming to that conclusion. Um, so this, these two paragraphs here, I'm reading from the article. The Rockefeller family think big oil, as big as oil gets, is the primary funder of 350.org. The Rockefellers, with other members of the plutocracy, such as the Clinton family, were also instrumental in the creation of One Sky, sister of 350.org, an organization which pushes false solutions and grossly inadequate climate legislation under the guise of grassroots democracy. One Sky is a prime example of an NGO created for the power elite. It operates as a think tank where past, present, and future policy analysts, high-ranking government officials, business leaders, and CEOs Intellectuals, journalists, and conservative activists come together to develop political vision and strategy. Many well-intentioned, well-respected individuals are manipulated into lending their involvement to such institutes, which in turn lends credibility to OneSky350.org and their ilk when they deserve none. Why are the big greens and compromised NGOs spewing out meaningless targets for legislation which do nothing more than ensure a death sentence for humanity? It is because they have become corporations themselves. They are, in essence, subsidiaries of the very corporations that they claim to oppose. There can be no meaningful mass movement when dissent itself is generously funded by those same corporate interests who must be targets of the protest movement. These big green groups have become barriers to the movement. They no longer represent civil society but stand as walls to protect the system. They utilize the coercive tactic of inviting supposed leaders of civil society into sanitized circles of power and simultaneously repress the rank and file climate movement. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the article recently in Miami New Times about Walmart also, um, but yes. Conservation International um, partnered with Walmart to do this jewelry line called Love Earth. <laughs> and um, they say that it's um, responsibly sourced with better mining practices, better work practices. But the article went on to expose that the gold um, that they mine, it has the same effects as any other gold mining. <laughs> they put cyanide into the water, they put mercury into the water. The, the work practices are actually, they set up fake factories. I think it was in Honduras that people could go and look at and see how nice they were, but they subcontract to other factories where people do the actual labor and they're super exploited, the same as with any other jewelry manufacturer. And um, Conservation International has a budget of $115 million a year, and um, the CEO, Peter Seligman, is a close friend of Rob Walton, the eldest son of Walmart founder, Sam Walton, and current, current company CEO. And Rob Walton is now the head of Conservation International's executive committee. So we can see how these corporations are tied to the NGOs intimately. I mean, they're the same people. And I also would like to add, ask, um, how is buying a piece of jewelry making you conserve the earth again? <laughs> well, I guess they think um, that if we destroy it just a little less, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, even the premise itself that it's done is wrong. <laughs> My name is Jared Goldberg. I served in the United States military for a while, U.S. Navy. I truly believe, looking back on those times, that yes, the U.S. military is an arm, an enforcement arm, of U.S. corporations. Specifically, the oil monopoly. We are going to sabotage you, hamstring you, and it is our job to rise above that. <clears throat> you know, okay, we see, we know, but we're not going to stop. That's the trick. Don't stop. Get a little passionate about it. Raise your blood pressure a little bit. It's good for you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> In London, okay. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, just a, a few broad strokes I wanted to throw in, some things I've been thinking about, uh, NGOs. Um, 
one thing I just uh, wrote down is uh, I think one of the limitations of, of NGOs in terms of uh, bringing some kind of actual political uh, power into the conversation to actually influence some change. Uh, it seems to me that even NGOs which have the best of intentions, um, whatever NGO may occur to you or that you may actually work for or run, um, it seems that we're, they, they don't actually, uh, they're not often enough building power within themselves, but they're relying on appealing to a power structure where the main um, form of influence is money. And relative to the existing structure, NGOs have a pittance. Uh, they have pennies compared to billions. And so if NGOs are always actually appealing to a, a power structure, which is operating uh, in the interest of actually accruing and maintaining capital, it seems like a losing proposition and a bad way of actually trying to accomplish some positive ends for society for the masses of people as a whole. Um, and I would love to you know, hear people who actually are involved with NGOs uh, address or challenge or talk about that. Um, it also, I was thinking this morning about um, how in, uh, in, in nature, just to use kind of an analogy, any genetic a geneticist is familiar with the proposition ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Um, which uh, basically, <laughs> basically <laughs> you're not a geneticist. Yeah, what can I tell you? Uh, basically, basically, what it means is that um, uh, higher forms actually uh, recapitulate the d lower forms as they develop and then develop into higher forms. Uh, but, but how that applies to what, what I'm trying to uh, actually get at is that in capitalist society institutions recapitulate capitalist social relations so that all of the institutions which we're familiar with, the important institutions in our society, for example NGOs, which Mark just talked about, organized labor, uh, religious institutions, academia, the media even, they all actually um, follow capitalist forms and so they actually ultimately do not challenge the system, they actually serve the system, okay? And, and NGOs are no different. The structures internally of most NGOs actually imitate the broader capitalist uh, structures. And um, the, just one, one other point that just occurred to me, I don't know if it's important or not, but it seems to me like the terms that we use to describe these institutions, uh, NGO, uh, is, is one, and it kind of sets up this binary which really obscures what the NGO is. I mean, we have NGO, and the opposite of that would be a governmental organization. A lot of people don't like governmental organizations just because they're part of the government. So if they're bad, well, the NGOs, they must be good. They must be doing something good. So it establishes kind of this false binary. Same thing with nonprofit. Um, which also essentially is just a legal term and, um, and in fact obscures the fact that a nonprofit is a form of business and actually they make lots of profits for the people that run them. And then to me the most odious uh, uh, word that describes these entities is charity or charitable organization. And when you start looking at actually generally who the main uh, benefactors are uh, in charities, uh, it's the people who run them. Um, mm -hmm. I think legally, actually, charities don't actually have to develop more than, uh, under certain laws, five, six percent of what they, Ten. what they raise, 10 percent? Okay. No, it's, Ten. Uh, it's five percent of their cap, of, of the money they are under, that they have under control, and that is in, in, in that includes the money they spend on administrative costs and rent and all that stuff. Okay. So a charity could actually spend no money on charity. Okay, so there you go. So who, who's, who's the benefactor of the charity? The CEO of the charity or, and his staff and his wife and his children. 
Um, and, um, and so basically this whole system of NGOs really is a way of maintaining capital among the capitalists. Doesn't mean that money on some level in good NGOs with good intentions doesn't filter into the community. But can we ultimately through the system change the balance of power? And it strikes me as, uh, resoundingly that the answer is no. And just to address the, what you were bringing up on a, a personal <coughs> level, I did work for uh, an organization, uh, Environment California, which is part of the Public Interest Research Group nonprofit system, uh, which also exists in Florida. It has an offshoot here called Environment Florida. And we were trying to organize the office, and we were stomped on like little gnats. Uh, so, uh, you know, just because it's nonprofit doesn't mean that it's socially conscious or pro labor, certainly. Yeah, a, a few things. I've, I've been concerned about NGOs and that sort of whatever the hell that means, anyhow. Um, no, I know that, but. Um, since it's been a while, remember when everyone's getting all excited about civil society? It's like, oh yeah, that's great. Because civil society was the people. In those other countries that we could funnel money through as NGOs rather than the governments that our government didn't like. And I started hearing people talk about, and people who were kind of left all excited about civil society, it's like, what are you thinking? And, and now it's kind of coming home to roost, I think, more. And we're, I think, more is becoming more aware. We say NGO, you know, first of all, there's a lot of different kinds of NGOs. I mean, I work for the University of Miami, and it would never occur to me that that's part of the movement. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, NGOs like the University of Miami is very different from the stuff. What Stephanie was talking about, very different from, you know, the, the worker center or the CIW, you know? And I think we have to, if we're going to really do an analysis, we have to talk about who we're talking about. And we have, the, the NGO term is way too broad to, to cover what we're looking at. Um, I mean, it never occurred to me that NGOs and the movement were the same. I would not say the NGOs are the movement. You know, I, I certainly don't expect that the NGOs are going to bring us revolution. Yeah. The, which doesn't mean, as Mark said, that they don't do some good charitable work. You know, a charitable organization helps people who are suffering right now. They don't change the world, but someone might have a, something to eat that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So, as you said, we want to be careful. I think one of the keys is we have to look at where they're getting their damn money. You know, before, as part of the analysis. Um, because if you start taking money from the foundations that were started by, you know, the robber barons, <laughs> or from the government, for God's sake, you're, you're going to be co-opted. Because there's going to be strengths. No one gives you money without strengths, and we know that. So how do we get out, like what you were talking about, the, the example that you gave of where all, you know, these, this NGO is getting, this supposedly environmentalist NGO is getting their money. If they're tied with Walmart, you would not expect the labor practices. <laughs> all good environmental practices, you know? And an environmental group is not necessarily going to give a shit about labor. And a labor organization might not be that concerned. You know, we, you know, different NGOs have different goals, and we have to kind of we can't paint it all with one brush stroke. But I think you know, follow the money is real important when we look at this. I'm really glad that people are looking at the NGOs more closely. We know that we've had some issues down here, <laughs> NGO interference in some of our movement work. So that's all. Right. Well, I want to talk about two. Uh, specific incidences involving NGOs that some of us experienced last year. One revolved around SB 1070, the Arizona immigration law, and the other one was the BP situation over in the Gulf. The first one I know Jeff could remember. We were organizing to do an action out at uh, Marlin Stadium uh, when the Arizona Diamondbacks came into town, and we were having these meetings which involved some of these NGOs. And we were trying to build up this coalition, this, you know, grassroots movement within South Florida to do what other people have done around the country, which is go to the, uh, the Arizona games and protest the law in Arizona. And when we started to build up this coalition and come out with, you know, statements and press releases, we were finding that the NGOs were trying to push the more left groups out of the picture. A prime example was that, and I think you remember with the SLA watch, 
which had endorsed the event, was kept off all the press releases and all the flyers because certain people within the group thought they were way too left for the general pop, you know, the general public to um, to get behind, you know, this. They would be detrimental to the event because they were too left, and this led to some really big arguments, and which shifts now into the BP situation right after the Hands Across the Stand event in, uh, in July, we attempted to organize on that energy and had a meeting in which something like 65, uh, 65 people showed up, which was, you know, huge. And what it became was a meeting being dominated by one sky. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the other group? Um, I forgot. 350. Uh, another, another, another NGO. Yeah, another NGO. <laughs> and and the, the facilitator at that event was like brushing everybody out to side the minute somebody from one of these NGOs would come in and, you know, basically interrupt the meeting and, and then get the floor to talk for whatever time they needed to talk about their specific event. I, I think this was a prime example of what you were talking about <laughs> and how they basically came in there and hijacked that whole group. Mm -hmm. And by the time, you know, what was it, like six, seven weeks later, that group almost completely dissolved. And, you know, that, that to me was a prime example of how these NGOs can be very destructive when you're trying to organize grassroots movements. If you don't mind, I'd rather not be filmed. Oh, sorry.